Welcome back. I'm Melanie Perry. I'm your first case co-host and team member from Beyond Clean. And I would like to just express my gratitude to you for choosing to spend your Saturday with me and Lisa and all of our exciting speakers. You are 100% making our day. And for that, we thank you. I would also like to thank our event sponsor, 3M, for helping to make this educational event possible today. I'm super excited to welcome you to our next session. We are going to switch things up a bit and ditch the PowerPoints for a panel discussion with a diverse group of industry professionals. This is going to be a really engaging discussion. Don't you think, Lisa? Yes, and joining us for a discussion on healthcare collaboration is Candace Kaufman. She is a sterile processing manager at UC Health in Colorado. She enjoys mentoring sterile processing technicians through education, and professional development to create sustainable change within the industry. Candace lives to advocate for SPD and gives frontline technicians a voice in the industry. Elizabeth Mario is a board certified infection preventionist at Arkansas Children's Hospital. Elizabeth specializes in fa facilitating and coaching teams and has a special interest in CLABSI prevention in neonatal ICU and sterile processing. She is a published author with a feature in infection control and hospital epidemiology, pediatric quality and safety, and neonatal network. And representing the operating room today is our co-host for today's event, Melanie Perry. Melanie has 19 years of experience as an RN and has spent the last 10 years in the OR. She is also the co-host of the First Case podcast, the founder of The Circulating Life, and perioperative clinical manager for Beyond Clean. She is passionate about OR education and loves to help others in the OR understand the why behind what we do. As healthcare professionals, we all know the key to patient safety relies heavily on the effective collaboration between the OR room, sterile processing, and infection prevention. So what happens if there's a gap in the chain of collaboration? We'll get ready to join the conversation as we tackle this critical topic and provide insights to building an environment of collaboration between these departments. So let's bridge the gap together. Join me in wel welcoming Candace Elizabeth to the virtual stage. Hey everyone. Hi. Well, it's good to be on this side of the panel and not hosting right now. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a refresher. Yeah. So let's get started. Um, why is collaboration and teamwork between departments so critical? So let's start with Elizabeth. Okay. So there's always, um, not like cooking, <laughs> and there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, having a collaboration with SPD and IP and OR is really so important because, and actually I would add quality to that because if you have a quality department, they can help guide you through um, quality um, projects. So, or we even have a process improvement team. So the more the merrier, I say everybody um, has an idea. They come from it from different sides. It's really nice to have uh, people that haven't, seen the process or don't know what it is to come in and look at it and ask questions because then you're like, oh, I never thought about that. Or somebody who doesn't have all this experience can really enlighten us and tell us something that we didn't realize before. And that makes us be better. It makes us all better for collaborating. No, I agree. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Go for it. <laughs> Okay, I, I do agree because when if we spend so much time working in all of our own separate circles and we don't ever pay attention to the other expertise and the other um, knowledge that's around us, then we, we don't benefit from what the other departments can provide. And because ultimately we all have the same goal and that's safe patient care and a, and a good patient experience. And if we're not working together and communicating with each other, then we're missing out on that expertise that other people can give to to the to the solution or to the issues yeah that's such a great point because uh i think it's very easy for us to be subject matter experts in our field and we get so focused on 
what we know and how it affects us. And I think we have general understandings of other areas, but to actually open that door and allow everybody to come to the table is huge um, because it's exposing us to maybe content that we wouldn't have thought of in our day to day. So it's super critical that we all um, work together and make sure that we're sharing that knowledge with each other, um, like Melanie noted, to make sure that we're giving our patients the best possible outcomes. Absolutely. So who's responsible for bridging the gap to ensure strong relationships develop between the departments? Uh, who verifies that there is an understanding and appreciation of everyone's responsibilities across OR, SPD, and infection control. You want to start with Melanie? Sure. Um, when you talk about who's responsible for bridging the gap, I think ultimately we all are. Um, we all have our own ability to reach across the aisle to Coming at it from an OR perspective anyway, I mean, we don't need to view the infection preventionist that's in the OR strictly as an auditor who's only there to get us all in trouble, but there's some, this is somebody who sees the situation with a different set of eyes and somebody that we can talk to to find out what we're doing. Or sterile processing, these are people that are making everything safe and sterile for us to use for surgery, so we need to treat them as the professionals and the team members that they are, because we're all part of the same team, and we're all working together. And if we keep this idea that we're all separate, this whole idea of segregation of these departments, we're not benefiting anybody and we're certainly hurting ourselves. Um, and then I really think of the other aspect is it is our department leaders. They set the tone, they set that attitude of either collaboration or segregation and it, that attitude kind of flows downhill. And so when you have leaders who understand the value of teamwork, of working with these other departments as not a threat to their own authority or their leadership, but as a way to improve, then you get a better overall teamwork from everybody in the facility. Yeah, so what do you think, uh, Elizabeth? Well, I would agree with that. Everybody has to take responsibility. Um, I think also accountability is something. So if you're, if you're having to do outcomes and measurements of outcomes that um, everybody's on the same page for doing, then you have something to strive for. Everybody knows what they're looking to do. Um, and it makes it a little bit easier to have kind of a roadmap that we all agree on so that we can help each other get to where we need to go. That's so true. So Candace, what, how do you want to weigh in? Yeah, no, I think um, both Elizabeth and Melanie are touching on um, some really critical points that bridging that gap has to come from a place of um, everybody's goal that we want to take care of our patients and keep them safe. Um, but it's certainly very important for leadership to really help guide staff to ensure that that's something we continue doing. Because again, it's very easy um, to just focus on each department's day to day um, and how it's impacting us and how we're gonna get through adversity. So being able to continue um, ensuring that that collaboration is happening uh, is huge. And that appreciation for understanding each person's role and how we can lean on each other is so drastically important, um, especially below the manager uh, or leadership level, because we want our technicians and scrub techs or RNs, um, even IP to feel very open with communicating with each other and ensuring that we're all on the same page, because we all know if we're not, that's when bad things happen. And kind of to tag on to that a little bit, what do you guys think about um, helping to encourage the frontline technicians to be more engaged with helping to bridge that gap and um, communicating more with infection prevention and the OR and so forth. Uh, I'll go. I think it's really important that the technicians themselves know what's going on. So how is an instrument that they're handling actually used in the OR? I think it's really important that they're included in um, either some in-services of how instruments are used or even watching surgeries, observing surgeries. Um, I think it's so important for them to see that their work is like they're literally handing that instrument to the surgeon through the surgical tech or the scrub nurse. Um, without them, they're not. There's nothing that's going to happen, right? It's, nobody's going to be doing any surgeries without sterile processing. 
So I, I think it's so important for them to know how important they are. And um, I think it's it, it comes from surgery and um, IP. I mean, everybody, like they need to know, people need to know they exist, that they're not just these dishwashers in the basement, right? That um, the surgeons come down and say, hey, you know, I was having this problem with some instrumentation not coming in my set and I just want you to know that I notice that it's coming now and it's consistent and I really want to tell you I appreciate your work. Two seconds. I mean, what is that? Um, you know, for that, for a, a surgical tech to be, or a um, sterile processing technician to be able to reach out to, or a surgical tech to be able to reach out to infection prevention, which I've had happen, say, hey, I need help with my boss for them, you know, to understand something. So you need a relationship, like it's a three-legged, the triangle, right? So we all have to have a piece of it. Without it, we're, we're nothing. We're just floating in the wind. So Candace, as a sterile processing leader, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, Elizabeth, those are some phenomenal points. Um, again, and I, you know, we've talked about this uh, before, and as we know in sterile processing, that it's not always common for an SPD tech to see the end product in use. Uh, getting up to the ORs and actually having techs see that, you know, not only is there a human being at the other end of those instruments, but how they're used and the impact that they're having on that individual. So that um, cross-education between departments and, again, seeing that bigger picture is huge. Not only does it help with the appreciation of what each department does, but it's offering that insight that will hopefully in turn empower technicians to understand the role that they play. And, you know, um, it, it's, it's something that I think we as leaders are constantly trying to encourage our teams to do instead of just running to a leader to say, hey, I need you to say this, or hey, can we get IP involved? And it's like, yeah, here's their contact information. Reach out to them, talk to them, right? It's not that you have to always go through the leader to make that happen. We want you to feel empowered to start those conversations. And yes, include your leadership, but you know, um, defaulting to expecting your leader to do that for you um, is definitely something I'd like to see change uh, in all areas, right? That, this is your department. This is your job. This is uh, your responsibility to make sure that you're taking that initiative as well to ensure that you're doing your part. And it's okay for you to reach out and it's okay for you to ask questions. Um, that's huge. I know for SPD tech. So really encouraging them, you know, kind of pushing them out of the nest sometimes to say, hey, you got this. Go ask that question. I think that's great. And let's bring it back to the team and let's talk about it. Yeah, no. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> that well, idea of ownership. Of, yeah, the idea of ownership is huge. Um, it's We all have a voice. We're all professionals. We don't need to carry the title of director or manager or whatever to recognize a problem or see an issue or have a question. And leaders, I don't think, should be threatened or feel worried about a, a team member going to ask a question. It, it's if they want to learn more or if they've noticed something, if this is more of a, let me learn it, let me find out what I need to know, but let me bring it back to the group and let's all learn together. But we all are professionals and all see things differently. So when we, when we can empower our staff to see something, see a problem and then reach out and ask a question and have those relationships, suddenly those, I think the walls get a little shorter and people become people again that we're working with. And it's not just, the scary auditor in the back of the room or that person in SPD that I don't really know, but that, you know, I see them every day when I take them a case cart, they're people with names and I can talk to them and then I can have a relationship and we can learn and we can grow. So Melanie, to start with you, on what level should physicians and surgeons be involved in this process? Okay. I had a whole answer planned out. And then we interviewed Dr. Rosen, or we listened to his presentation earlier today. <laughs> and if you missed that presentation, you need to go back and watch it. It was fantastic. But he really kind of like set the bar up here for the level of where surgeons should be involved in this process. He has gotten into sterile processing and he's worked in there and he's seen what our technicians down there are doing. He He's in his rooms, opening his trays, looking at those instruments with his surgical techs to make sure that everything is set up. So there's a standard there that I feel like he kind of set the bar a little higher than what I was expecting. But typically in my experience, you know, the surgeons, 
they come in the room after the patient's in the room. We've got them draped. It's time to start. And they usually are aware if there's an, somebody auditing in the room. They might not know who they are or what they've got, but they know they have a clipboard and they know somebody's watching for something. And they know that somebody down in sterile processing is making sure their trays are clean and instruments are ready to go. But they usually don't venture beyond the OR. They don't venture beyond just that area. Um, if there's an issue, they take it to the team leader or to OR manager to solve the problem with the with the tray. Or they send, you know, if there's an infection issue, that might come out later in, you know, in clinic or in some other physician meetings. But it's, you don't see that happening in the operating room. But I really feel like if they went to sterile processing or if they got to know our infection preventionists or if they were there were teams maybe that 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 included our surgeons so that their voice was heard because let's be honest when a surgeon's voice starts getting louder and louder people listen and surgeons can really sometimes make change happen faster than others of us can but if they understood who the techs were they knew what was going on behind the closed doors of sterile processing they knew who our infection preventionists were and what they were doing they're not just there watching them to get them in trouble but if they understood the whole purpose of it i think that we would have a smoother process so i think they should be involved ultimately to answer that whole question is I think that they should be involved at it from the from the ground level. We should have their voices too because they're just as much a part of our team as everybody else. So Elizabeth, as an infection preventionist, what is your experience with um, the surgeon involvement? So yeah, I mean, they don't get involved very much, right? They're in their um, surgical services meeting um, they and then they're in their operating room so they're not really down on the ground floor like um melanie was saying and like i was saying before i mean just a quick visit to the sterile processing technician team is a big deal for them to be like okay so what i'm doing makes a difference and it's not that my boss is telling me what to do or somebody's yelling at me from the or on the phone saying, I need it now because the surgeon's yelling at me and I'm trickling down that stuff downhill. Um, you know, they can they can do in-services with sterile processing, right? So um, they can show slideshows. And again, going back to the um, how is an instrument used and, you know, really saying, you know, that knowing that those people are there holding you up is and that you acknowledge that is so important. Um, and and for the sterile processing te technician to know that the surgeon took the time to come down and say something to them, I mean, that makes all the difference. They're human beings. They should be treated as such, you know? So I hope that answered the question. <laughs> well, Candace, from the SPD side, how do you think that we can engage surgeons to spark their interest to come down and give in services to the sterile processing teams? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And obviously I'm over here like shaking my head to everything that Elizabeth and Melanie are saying. And, um, you know, I'm a little biased, but I think that it's incredibly taboo still to have this direct relationship between a physician and even the technicians, right? So a lot of that information is always filtered uh, through leadership, like Melanie had notated, and being able to bridge that gap so that there is an open dialogue and that we can even touch on some positive and educational points before it's to the point of something going wrong. Because let's be honest, that's usually when SPD is interacting with the physician. And if it is a technician, uh, most of the time they're freezing because they feel you know, very inequipped to have that conversation and they feel like, you know, maybe they don't have all of the knowledge and skills and it can be intimidating, right? Like you feel all of a sudden, like now I'm just this little technician with this tiny certification and I'm going, you know, toe to toe with this physician who's been in medical school for years and years and years and what they say goes and it's hard to stand my ground and say, you know, well, this is what I know as an SCE tech. And the more that we can encourage those interactions in a positive light before that technician has that bad experience that, you know, really puts that 
terrible taste in their mouth for the rest of their career, um, which oftentimes can be career ending for a sterile processing tech. And I think many of us have been in that situation and even as a manager sometimes, right? Like I stand there and having to stand firm in something and say, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And here is why um, is not what a physician wants to hear in the moment when, you know, they have a contaminated instrument and patients on the table and they're frustrated and now the whole OR team's frustrated and all of a sudden IP is getting pulled in and you come together after the fact for this um, negative interaction. So being proactive, I think is huge. And having an in-service that has nothing to do with something that went wrong would be huge. Like just say, hey, let's learn about how this surgery is done. And this is physician so-and-so and welcome to the team. And here's a name and a face. And um, this physician is also a human being and not a robot. And they're really not that scary and big <laughs> and mean. And it's okay for us to befriend them and you know interact on a positive level. So again, when you cross each other in the hallway, it's like, hey, what's up, Dr. So-and-so? And they remember like, oh, hey, that's our SPD tech. And it's Bridging those gaps is huge and it's just not the norm. So the more we encourage that, I think has a huge impact. Candace, I love that response. And it really does segue perfectly into the next question, which is what are the most common communication challenges and misunderstandings between the departments? That's a, a great question. Um, and I won't hog the spotlight on this one, but I know that um, very easily um, the lack of understanding between departments um, and it can create friction. So let's say bio burden does go up to the OR and, you know, even the slightest comment of uh, a scrub tech or a circulating nurse saying like, oh, every time we have this case, this always happens. Right. And whether they work with that physician all of the time or not, now that physician has in their mind like, oh, wow, we have a major problem. Like, what is SGD doing down there? And then now all of a sudden I'm getting an email that's like, hey, I'm really concerned because it sounds like we're having major issues. And then when you pull the data, it's like, well, one instance of a bio burden has gone up in over, you know, 400 cases. So, yes, while it's not great, um, you know, those little frustrations that happen on a day to day can really lead to really bigger issues if we don't start breaking them down and again, making those connections so we can tackle some of these things before they happen. Melanie, what are some of the most common challenges in communication that you find in the OR? Well, first to jump off of what Candace said, you know, when you're scrubbed into a case and you're standing there with the surgeon and you've just had to break down the case because there was a, something was wrong in a tray and you had to sit back up and then you're delayed and the surgeon's mad. When you stand there and badmouth SPD with the surgeon while they're operating because they're angry, it doesn't help with communication and it doesn't help with teamwork and collaboration. It only stirs them up and then leads to that angry surgeon coming down to SPD and yelling about something that might actually not Yes, it was bad that it happened that one time, but it might not be as prevalent as, you know, it may, got got made out to be because, you know, maybe the nurse and the tech were also angry about the setup or whatnot. And so sometimes I think those of us in the OR need to remember that mm. we do have the surgeon's ear um, when we're in those cases. And the things that we say can make our other departments look a lot worse but they can also make them look better and we can build our team members up or we can build, tear them down. And it just depends on what we say and how we, the words we choose and how we react to the different, you know, cause I mean, we're human. There are going to be things that come up and there's going to be mistakes that are found, but how we treat everybody else on our team, because everybody's on our team, how we treat the rest of our team members really determines the course of action from there on out. Um, but then also we see a lot of, shirking responsibility or passing blame, um, going back and forth between SPD and OR. It's, it's, it's a two-way street. It's not one department or the other always at fault or always, you know, blaming, but we both do it. You know, the, the tray comes up and it has this on it. Well, SPD, always, it's always this problem. They always do that. Or we send a case card up and we didn't do any of the cleaning we were supposed to do. The OR never does their point of use cleaning and they leave all these reamers constantly covered with junk that we have to clean off. Or, you know, it, it goes back and forth and going back to the fact that we're all on the same team. I mean, and really when you change your perspective to realize that we all have the same goal, we are all on the same team. 
when I'm passing that blame and throwing that onto the other department, yeah, I might not see them because they're down in the basement or they're somewhere in another building. We're still all doing the same job ultimately to give our patients a safe patient experience. And I'm hurting the whole outcome by that blame instead of looking towards where maybe if there's an issue that we should be able to solve it. Um, and then both of us together, OR and SPD, none of us like it when somebody shows up with a clipboard to <laughs> show up with infection prevention. <laughs> so we all get, it doesn't matter who we are, we're going to throw the side eye at anybody who has an audit sheet or a clipboard and be like, what are you doing here? And do you really know what we do before you start judging us? That's how we look at it. Um, do you really understand our job before you're telling me whether or not we did it correctly? And um and I think when you look past the audit part of what infection prevention does, and like in the thing they said last night, they're there observing, they're there watching. They are, um, once again, somebody with a different set of eyes looking at what we do to help keep us accountable, but to you know help keep our patients safe. Um, it's changing your perspective, changing the way you see things, but um, it's more than a clipboard. It's more than an auditor. It's somebody there to help make us do better. Um, I think we can learn a lot from just changing the way we look at everybody who comes in and out of these departments. So Elizabeth, what's your take on from coming from a different perspective on the communication barriers between departments? Well, so I was an OR nurse and then I was in charge of sterile processing and now I'm an IP. So it's hard for me to change my hats, right? Because I know all <laughs> the different areas. So I understand the um, the miscommunication is often we're in such time pressure. We need to get stuff done. We have to get it done now. There's a person on the table. You know, the, the stakes are high. Whenever the stakes are high, things are going to get heightened, right? So before, you know, what Candace was talking about being proactive, you want to have developed relationships. So maybe have like, if there's a service lead in the SPD, that you can set them up with a service lead in the OR. So I'm doing general surgery down down in the basement, you know, um, or wherever your serial processing is, and you know somebody else is doing um, in the OR. And what you do is you have this dyad, and you get these two together, and you're like, let's make sure the preference cards are correct. Let's make sure that because that's a communication tool, right? If that's wrong, then forget it. You're going to be missing stuff all the time. Um, because what we find where I work is that the preference cards are, you know, not updated all of them, and there's like, you know. June, who does this, these cases all the time, and she knows she has to pull three more instruments, but if June's on vacation and Harry's doing the case and he doesn't know and he thinks the preference card is the preference card, and then he's mad because he's getting yelled at by the surgeon and the surgeons, you know, and it trickles downhill and downhill, unfortunately, is SPD. So I feel like, you know, the more that the relationships are built and also that, hey, you know, we hear you from the SPD department, we hear you in the OR. This is like what Candace said, we looked it up. We saw that this happened one time in the last year, you know, so we're keeping an eye on it. Let us know anytime that happens. And, you know, we hear you, we're working on this. If this is something that can't be changed easily, it's in progress, you know, so they know what's going on. And also what Melanie was talking about is talking people up, right? So. You know, we're supposed to do that with our patients. Oh, you have Dr. So-and-so or Nurse So-and-so, or they're the best, they're excellent at what they do. But that doesn't happen with the surgical techs and um, the scrub techs, uh, or the scrub techs and the surgical techs, right? It's like, oh, hey, I got the doctor's ear and I'm gonna whisper in the ear and be like, you know, they always do this and I don't want them yelling at me, so I'm gonna get them to yell at somebody else, right? <laughs> but um, the other day I had a surgeon say to a surgical tech, if I get a dirty instrument, I'm blaming you because it does start in the OR and it does start with that point of use cleaning. And if you're not taking that responsibility in the OR, especially with cannulated instruments, you, we, we know that it could dry on there, that it's hard to get it out, um, that maybe the steam pressure once it's cleaned and you know the steam pressure pushes it out and then there you go, you got this stream of whatever coming out of your suction um, when you're at the field, I mean, that is everybody's responsibility, what we were talking about earlier about responsibility and accountability. So if it's not just the sterile processing fault, it's not just the OR fault, you know, we have to do it all together. And as far as um, observing during surgeries, you know, again, the IP needs to have some sort of relationship. 
hey, you've seen me around. I'm just watching. I'm not even going to say anything. I'm just like, oh, maybe ask a couple questions. I can tell you, working in surgery, if you ask the surgeon a couple of questions, like, oh, can you help me understand this? They love that, right? So that's how you can start building relationship. And same with anybody. Ask somebody that's scrubbing. How do you do that? Or why, how do you know how to do that? Or how do you set up your Mayo stand? Do you set it up like everybody else or do you do it different? And, you know, that kind of thing. And sterile processing, you know, but all, it, people, again, people want to be knowing that they're being heard, that they matter, and what they do makes a difference. So, Elizabeth, you mentioned the preference cards. And I wanted to jump in on that real quick and kind of bring up the idea of the context behind some of the problems um, and why there, why um, context is such a huge issue with communication um, barriers. And for example, I was in a project to improve um, the preference cards at one of the facilities I worked at. And there were, I was coming in from the SPD perspective and it, this was like a multidisciplinary group. And one of the things that came out that I didn't know at the time was that um, the, uh, the system that we were working with, um, for our healthcare records, our, um, electronic, uh, healthcare records, it was, um, it had a feature that after a certain time frame, the preference cards would go dormant. And so, you know, if the, the team of nurses who were the clinic, clinical um, individuals in charge of certain specialties went in and updated their preference cards. It only would do it for the active cards, not the ones who were dormant. So when they had another procedure, let's say months later or even a couple of years later, then suddenly they wanted to use uh, a, a specific card that was dormant. They would reactivate it, but it wouldn't be updated. So it's interesting when you think about the reasons why and you understand the context, suddenly it's not, oh, well, this specific quality or this coordinator didn't update their cards. Then maybe that's not the issue at all. So um, I think that, you know, we tend to forget that there's other systems at play um, that are influencing factors. Um, so uh, kind of Adding on to that idea, why do you think that facilities struggle to implement a collaborative process? Maybe we'll start with uh, Melanie on this one. Um, I think part of it has to do with, you hear the word silo thrown around a lot, and we are, we're all in our own little bitty silos, and we see, I guess maybe I speak at it from the OR, but you know, we see like, like we're the main thing and everybody else exists to help us, right? And then, and so it's it's maybe coming at it from that perspective is maybe not the best approach, <laughs> but also, you know, if you're up here on the fourth floor in the OR, but infection, preve infection prevention's in another building altogether, and then sterile processing is down in the basement, it really isn't easy to get your leadership together or to get everybody together for maybe an educational meeting or some type of team meeting or, even a meeting maybe once a week or once a day to talk about issues that you're having because everybody's all over the place. And so when people are so spread out, it really does make it hard to come together. And then you add those attitudes to it of who may be the superior or the inferior or the better or whatever, or who's helping whom, I don't know. And then it adds to even more problems um, if your attitude's not in the right space. So what's your take, Candace? Yeah, I mean, um, one thing that I love uh, or the term that I've learned from my HR that I love is assuming positive intent. Um, and that is so challenging to do when you work in a high stress environment and it's go, go, go. Um, and like Melanie noted, we could be in completely different areas of a hospital or a facility. We all have these time constraints, right? So the OR is worried about first case on time starts and turnovers and uh, SPD is worried about getting instrumentation um, upstairs and oftentimes uh, very short staffed uh, along with the OR. 
Um, and you throw all of these things into the mix and everybody's stressed and everybody's worried about what they're supposed to be doing. And it's very easy to look at things in a negative light. Um, so again, when a case card comes down and it's not pre-cleaned properly and SPD does the same thing of like, oh, every time somebody sends me this case card, it looks like this. Um, and it's that same dialect of like now the newbie SPD tech hears that and the next time they get a case card from that person, they're automatically like, well, this is going to be terrible, right? So that huge piece of assuming positive intent and knowing that, hey, it's actually really challenging to find a malicious individual that works in these industries. If these individuals didn't care about people and patient safety, they wouldn't be doing this job. Right now, that's not to say that bad ones don't exist, right? They, they can everywhere, but the majority of individuals are good people. They care about what they do. They're passionate about what they do. And we have to remember that when things get a little hairy sometimes. Um, and that, that teamwork thing uh, that both Elizabeth and Melanie have noted on is huge. Um, it had been, you know, quite a few years of me doing SPD before I stepped into the surgery center world and started getting referred to as like part of the team. Because for the first time, I was working in a facility where the ORs were right outside of where sterile processing was. Um, and to even get pulled in for, like, team meetings. And they're like, hey, Candace, are you come in? Like, it's time to do our team meeting. And I'm like, you want SCD there? Like, you want me to come and talk to you about these things? Like, okay, sure, let's do it. Like, I'm part of the team. That's awesome. Um, and it gets a little more challenging the bigger the facility gets to continue making that a reality. But it's so important. Um, because the more we stay disconnected and frustrated, the harder it is to give our patients those positive outcomes that they are counting on from all of us. Because, you know, they don't, they don't need to know about the drama between facility or, you know, departments or, or people. They are counting on us to show up, do our job, do it correctly, so they can go home and heal after a surgery. Do you think that um, personnel or onboarding process challenges come into mix on some of that uh, difficulty to get collaboration um, going? Yeah, I know on the SPD side, um, that's, that's a huge pain point for us because as we all know in SPD particularly, we are always short staffed, right? It feels like this perpetual a uh, realistic piece that is kind of just uh, um, a normal thing for us to deal with an SPD, right? It's very rare that we are fully staffed and fully equipped to do our jobs correctly. Um, and, you know, even particularly right now, a lot of ORs are facing those same challenges. So you constantly have turnover of staff, you have new staff, you have travelers, and there's never enough time to sit down and say, okay, this is why we're point of use cleaning, right? And then on top of that, you're, you know, there's not always this level of standardization everywhere. So everyone will hear you like, oh, you'll hear people say it's, it's the same job. You just have to learn how this facility does it. And while that's true, um, it's, it's frustrating too, because you would think that everywhere we would have a more cookie cutter format of like, hey, this is point of use cleaning and this is why you're doing it. And oftentimes you will work with maybe people that have been in the industry where the emphasis wasn't put on point of use cleaning 10 or 15 years ago. And to them, they still don't get it. Like, why is this a focus? That's not my job. SCD is supposed to clean the instruments. Well, yes. However, it starts with you guys. And now we're having to reteach people um, all while, again, you're getting travelers that are just here for so many weeks and you're giving them a crash course and this is how it works and go because we need you. Um, and again, there's never enough time to sit down and do the in-services we want to do and help everybody meet. So it's a major challenge. And it, you know, that in and of itself is a full-time job to try and keep that going because surgery doesn't stop. Melanie or Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts to add to that? I would echo everything you both said. Um, I think w when you're onboarding, it might be the best time to let people shadow because they're not an integral part of your um, work team yet. So that might be a good idea to maybe hook them up with somebody in the OR or vice versa. I mean, I think that um, SP... OR folks should go through SPD 
And I think SPD folks should go through the OR. And I think IP should go through both. I think IP should learn how to um, clean a scope and put an instrument set together and be in decontam. I think that's really important for people to understand. It's kind of like that undercover boss show, you know what I mean? You're going to find people that are doing the right thing and that um, positive intent. Is that what you said, Candace? I love that so much. I'm going to like tattoo that on my arm. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I just, the more people know each other as people and know each other's jobs and how they fit into the, the whole thing, go back to this, then I think it's really important. So then uh, why do you, why do facilities, um, I guess I'd like to ask, discuss some, let's, let's talk about some examples of successful collaborative partnerships. So um, do you guys have experiences where you uh, saw that there were methods that were used, um, maybe give us some examples of why they worked and who was involved? I can talk about um, something that we had. We had an ortho surgeon that um, was having issues with every tray. And so um, what we did is we had um, SPD go up when the surgical tech or the um, OR nurse was opening the trays so that they could be there at the same time as the trays were open. So if something's going wrong, they can fix it immediately. And also they can both see with their own eyes that, okay, it's okay everything's fine and we're and we're recording this right so we know what's really happening and i think that's like kind of like that buddy system where you know or is holding spd accountable because spd is there and spd is holding or accountable because they're there and um so we did that for a while we wrote down the errors we um, did any kind of training we could or extra training or whatever talked about point of use cleaning i mean there are like 101 things that you need to know in sterile and in, in, when you're doing surgery, right? You need to make sure you give the right instruments, but you have to be cleaning them as you go on, especially if you're in an ortho case. That should be taught in scrub tech school or scrub nurse school or whatever. Um, that's 101. That's basic stuff. You need to be cleaning your instrument before you hand it back to the to the surgeon every time, if you can. I mean, sometimes it's super fast, um, but as best you can. And flushing your your cannulated instruments and all that stuff, and, um, and and making sure that you know everybody's accountable. So I go back to the point of use cleaning. But you know, um, I'm hearing you, surgeon. I'm looking at this. I'm hearing you, surgical tech, that this is happening, or surgical nurse, and I'm here, and I'm going to take care of it right away. If there's a problem, if there's not a problem, we're recording both both things and we're going to see that we went from maybe here with some data to show surgeons because they love data right um to show that it went from here to here and we're listening to you and we're doing something about it um so we did that and our issues went down and um i think it, it kind of also helps okay i'm i'm knowing this person's face or at least half their face with their mask on you know that they're in surgery with me they're taking accountability as a person as a department and um you know i'm looking at this and we're working together to try to make this better that was a, that was a success for us Melody? we did the same thing yeah we did the same thing uh, that you did we had a particular orthopedic surgeon who um very Attentive to detail, I could have an excellent surgeon really, but um, we were having some issues with our trays and some contamination issues. And we brought in, I was the team leader for orthopedics. And so between team lead and then sterile processing leadership and um, our director, and then also looking at data later on for surgical site infections or potential, you know, all that stuff that came in on the back end that we use with infection prevention, but we did, we would, Every case, we would have to pass on if there was any error, if there was any problem with the trays, any um, anything that was an issue. And we, of course, with him, we even went so far not just to look at tray issues, but was this, were we actually putting the blame where the blame belonged? It might not have been a tray issue at all, even though sometimes that seems to be the first person we blame is sterile processing if there's a problem, but it could have been that the patient didn't get blocked like they were supposed to, and they laid in the block room for two hours, and they got back to the room completely unrelated to instrument issues. So we, we looked at all of the variables and pulled them all in. 
but we in the process if there was a tray issue you know i was sending that to the leadership in sterile processing letting them know hey this tray had a hole or this tray had this but we did have a backup or we had what we needed and in the process we also worked on ramping up how many um back how many instrument trays we had so that we weren't because we were doing so many total joints at one time in the hospital that we just didn't have enough um total joint trays and so we we ramped up how many trays we had so that if there was an issue we weren't delaying a case because of an open tray but ultimately working with sterile processing and then getting the data from infection prevention on um if there were you know negative effects with this stuff for him helped him and it also helped our he stopped he i guess he stopped complaining as much because he knew that we were working on it and he saw where it was improving. And then we also going back to that's actually, this is the same surgeon I was referencing with the standing at the table, mouthing off in his ear, because this is where we had people that were upset and frustrated and they were sitting there telling him that this was always a problem. And yeah, we were having issues, but it wasn't as, it wasn't that always that he was getting told. And so trying to, to really put the truth to the light of what the real issue was um, and where it was and solving the real problem. And then also that fixing that, maybe that mouthy attitude a little bit and making sure that we were all working as a team, it helped, so. Candace, do you have any examples of some good collaborative scenarios? Yeah, um, you know, I love that both Elizabeth and Melanie have touched on data. Um, and that's something that I think is very important for SBD techs to understand. Um, and I know as a leader, I try to be very transparent about this because that data is what drives change, right? It's very challenging in SPD because, you know, I can say, again, being very biased, that it's easy to look at things and question like, well, why don't we just buy more instruments? Why don't we, you know, just buy this piece of equipment? Why can't we just make this happen? So that data is important on both sides to not only bring to upper level leadership uh, physicians, IP uh, directors and whatnot to be able to help them understand what we need in SPD to do our job correctly, um, but also on the flip. So SPD understands like why it's so challenging for us to drive change, right? Um, and one thing, you know, we, I've talked about this um, in the previous panel that I did that we um, do in fact send uh, SPD tech to OR Huddle every morning. Um, and that is great because not only are they making that connection with one another, but we're, we're having that open line of communication each day where we can touch on a couple of pain points from day prior and then talk about needs for same day and we can address them right then and there. Um, and then secondly, I think it was um, Elizabeth that had noted on this, having like a service team lead, we also do that, right? Where we have a point person for each of our OR and scrub tech service line leads to go to. So we're funneling information through a specific SPD tech, and then it's that SPD tech's job to make sure that their team is aware of what's going on. Um, and, you know, we also have our service line technicians come to SPD huddles, especially to do an in-service. Um, just last week, my ENT coordinators came to me and were like, hey, so kind of a unique problem, and we want to address it, um, and that we're getting some extra instruments in our set." Right. And so we collaboratively work together because I'm like, I'll be honest with you guys. When I when I tell my techs, hey, there's extra instruments, they're immediately going to be like, OK, well, jackpot, like we just gave you some extra stuff to work with. What's the problem? Right. And, you know, um, giving them the message of, hey, what this lets us know is that if there's extra instruments in this set, odds are there's probably another set that doesn't have these items or we're short on the peel pack wall pars. Right, so then all the SPD techs are like, oh, okay, so it is a little bit of an issue here. In their minds, they're like, okay, cool, we gave you some extras, what's the big deal? Um, so really like bridging that gap and allowing that communication, um, me as a leader, I want that to happen. Um, even if I'm not there, please talk to one another, make those connections um, and work together. Because the other thing to touch on um, outside of physicians too, if we're talking about orthopedics and spine specifically is vendors. And they are very much involved in what is happening. And sometimes I'm um, in you know, a big project right now working with a vendor and us trying to follow their IFU and all along the way, specifically educating that physician of why SPD is doing something that we have to do. Um, and it's, it's unique with vendors uh, because they do have a, a lot of knowledge with that instrumentation, 
but SPD is the subject matter expert in processing that information or those instruments, excuse me, um, and bringing that together because, again, the vendor can be somebody that works very closely with that physician. And, it, you know, from the SPD perspective, it's like everybody, it seems like everybody knows how to do SPD's job until it's time to be accountable for what SPD did or did not do. Um, and that's a huge piece with vendors too. So being able to have that communication, that collaboration, that open line of communication, um, and then address things, what's working well, where can we make adjustments? How did we miss this? What can we do better next time? Um, because we're not all perfect. And I think there's always room for improvement and we have to be okay with that. We can't take too much pride to know that we can make a change to better serve our patients. I love that you brought up the vendor piece because that's that's really important. So like you guys all just shared some successful communication examples, can you describe some examples of unsuccessful collaborative partnerships um, and then what those methods were and why they did not work well? I can speak to something that happened. Um, this this was with the this was like with the OR and IP, so it really didn't have to do with um, serial processing much. But um, there was a couple of infections in our neonatal population, and I was asking everybody, you know, what specifically their part is. Like, hey, OR, was there any construction going on at the time? Was did, Were there any open ceiling panels or was um, anything water leaking or anything like that during the time of surgery in another room or around that area? And, um, and I also sent something out to surgeons to see, um, you know, are we prophylaxing, you know, you know, are we doing all the things that we need to do? And because I was doing it like in a silo, <laughs> Candace, I think said that earlier. Um, it, while because I was doing that like separately, I think they thought I was blaming them instead of like they didn't know I was asking everybody. They just thought, oh, you think it's my fault, and I'm. They got their hackles up and got defensive. So I learned a lesson there about hey, I'm asking everybody about this. I'm asking EVS. I'm asking the OR. I'm asking surgery, I'm asking anesthesia, and I'm asking the NICU, I mean, what, you know, different parts of this puzzle so I can try to figure out where we might have some gaps that we can address. So that didn't go well in that. And so I would say everything really goes back to communication <laughs> and the way you communicate to people. And I think it's easier to communicate with people when you have a relationship with them, or at least they know your face, right? So that's um, that might be something like, hey, you know, Sonia, put your um, tray together today. So here's what Sonia's face looks like, <laughs> you know, here's a picture of Sonia, um, you know, thank you for Sonia. And then, you know, I'm Sonia, I'm going to make sure my tray looks good because my picture is going to be up there in the OR. I don't know. There's <laughs> things like that, that you can help. If you can't be there in person, you can be like, this is the person who's, who's, you know, making, you know, the, the helping you help the patient without this person and her face, you're not going to be able to do this work. So we just have to know that. And I think it's, a, it's so important, again, that people are seen and heard and, and known. What are your thoughts, Melanie? Um, I mean, for, I don't know if it's unsuccessful or maybe if it was just frustrating for me when I was a team leader would be when we would get emails from infection prevention that said John Smith was a patient four months ago, you know, on this day at this time, and now they have this infection. And um, can you tell us what went wrong during the case or what happened during the case that might have led to it? And I'm like, I don't know. That was four months ago. I mean, it, it, and I don't know how maybe to improve that because obviously you don't you don't know you have to go back and do tracing after the fact if somebody has a surgical site infection and I understand that, um, but it was always we didn't really see our infection preventionists except when they were there auditing or when we got this email and they were expecting a long list of information from us for something that we really we really couldn't provide just because 
it's been too long. I, I don't know. Or we'd get the same kind of questions about, you know, if we flashed anything or if we had used anything um, or if there'd been any issues with trays. And so then you're, you know, scrambling to go back in, in the recesses of your memory. I mean, like flashing, you have records of, but you don't necessarily have records of if there were any other sterility issues or, you know, trying to make sure anybody remembers because, you know, they've slept since then. So they might not know. Um, so that was probably the most unsuccessful or frustrating thing that we dealt with was that trying to go back and trace that stuff on the back end because we are it's it's so fast paced and we just move on from one to the other and one to the other and on we go and we don't and because our patients come in and they go out we, we don't see them again so trying to remember to go back three or four months down the road and remember what happened is difficult but i think what what you said though about the people that we work with having a face and they have a name and they are people and the more we remember that um and i just it can take something that's unsuccessful and now suddenly you have a, a relationship and you have a collaboration. Hey, let's sit down and work together. Help me remember, kind of help me with this, with this patient. What was it? What happened? And if I can sit down and have a conversation with somebody that I've got a good relationship with, maybe you can help jog my memory or we can, we can work on this and maybe I can go see who I need to talk to to find out that, you know, random emails, you know, about, in data for cases I can't remember. It got frustrating, but I think there's ways to improve it. So we've got about five minutes left. And so there was a comment from one of our per participants who said, um, you gave the suggestion of asking when SPD or when a new surgeon comes um, to a facility would um, SPD be invited to go and actually meet that physician? I think that's maybe, you know, because we've suggested that the surgeons come down to SPD and get a, an, a bird's eye look of what's going on down there, which is extremely important. But I thought that was interesting that they brought that up. Um, and then to that point, uh, in your opinion, should SPD, OR, and IP uh, require departmental rotations? And if so, what should that frequency be? Should it be weekly, monthly, quarterly? What do you guys think? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one real quick. I think um, that is a great idea when a new physician comes on board to again, get everyone at the table. Um, and I think it was Elizabeth that said, you know, this is not an industry where we're afraid to have too many cooks in the kitchen as long as we can build um, a great collaboration and ensure that all of us are working after the same goal. Um, so I love that. I think that's a, a great idea. And whatever a facility could do to ensure that that's happening would be huge. Um, and I know the SPD would appreciate it uh, because oftentimes, like Melanie had noted, right, that our physicians do tend to have a lot of pull. And um, especially if they tend to be more of a, a squeaky wheel, good or bad, they they are really able to leverage their position to assist and help and build uh, better departments. And if we can ensure that we're trying to use that for good it, rather than evil, right, like instead of trying to get people in trouble, um, how can we use that to benefit and grow one another? Um, and then with departmental rotations, I think it's phenomenal. Obviously, the challenges we face to make that a reality um, are the hardest part, especially as leaders, right? Because we're trying to meet the needs of every single day operationally. Um, and we really just have to make time to make sure that we can have those moments where we're disconnecting for, you know, hopefully 30 minutes, 45 minutes to allow those rotations to happen. And it can be frustrating. And sometimes you got to get, you know, a little creative with how you make it happen. Um, whatever cadence the facility can allow, I think is important. You just have to stick to it, even if it's painful and it means that, we're having to substitute or supplement with PRN staff, with leadership saying, hey, I got to clear my calendar, calendar. I need to go help in decon so my tech can go up to the OR or vice versa. Um, you just got to make it happen because there's never a good time to stop and just say, hey, let's just take a whole hour for everybody to um, educate one another and have a conversation. And it's hard, but we have to do it. Any other final thoughts before we conclude? Um, I, I want to agree with Candace. I think that it's a priority 
issue and you have to make you have to make time and make that type of learning a priority for all of our stuff. I mean, ORs right now are short staffed and running like crazy. I know SPD seems to always not have enough people. Um, and I, I'm not familiar with infection prevention, but given the healthcare crisis like it is right now, I can imagine that y'all don't have enough people all the time either. Um, and one thing, it was a phrase that came up actually in one of the first case podcasts that we were recording a few weeks ago. And we were talking about um, actually in the context of education for OR nurses and how sometimes they get thrown into stuff before they have really an understanding of what's going on. But you have to have context for the content. So when you go to learn something, you, you've got to have that context. You've got to know in what in what area is this? How does this apply? How does this work? I can throw education at you all day long, but if you don't have a frame of reference to hook that on and to frame it, it doesn't do you any good. So I think sending people when they're new in these interdepartmental rotations can be helpful. It can give like a small groundwork, but then once they've been in the OR or once they've been in sterile processing and they know what those gelpies are used for, or they know what that system eight is used for, and then they've put it together thousands of times and then they go back into the OR and they see it in use, suddenly they have that context for the content and it makes even more sense and it applies even more because they can really frame it on what they've learned. Um, I think that applies to all of us. We're, we're lifetime learners. We're never done learning. We're always going to be learning and recognizing who that we have around us has something to add. Everybody has value to give and we all have a voice that in a different perspective and together we can really collaborate and bring that all to the table to make a better experience for everybody. All right, wonderful. Well, Melanie, you want to go ahead and close this out? Sure, let me switch screens. Give me one second. This has been good. I will sit here and ramble for a second while I do that, but I have enjoyed this immensely. Um, and maybe I talked too much. I don't know. But um, <laughs> let's see. Let's go. <laughs> but, but really, Candace, Elizabeth, Lisa, this was a great conversation and a great discussion. Thank you. Um, just for being here and for being able to talk about these issues and really taking an honest look, I think, at some of the struggles um, and challenges that we face within our own departments. Um, we had a lot of questions come through, a lot of statements, a lot of comments, but if we didn't get to your question, um, you can connect with any of us um, through email or LinkedIn. Both of those options can be found um, in the speaker bio tool on the right side of your screen. And remember, you will be able to access the CE survey and certificate at the end of today's six sessions. And just a reminder, you will see bonus CE content found in the resources window on the right side of your screen. Now we'll have about a 13 minute break before the next session to so grab a drink, get a snack, do some jumping jacks, and then come back and we will see you for our next session. Thanks. Bye.